My name is Ed Tawaniak, and I am the um, editor of Etc. And um, that's an important introduction because, uh, first of all, a shameless plug to please uh, contribute your scholarly work and your interest in general semantics to the journal. We look forward to publishing your work uh, in the months ahead. And also, um, I'm going to give you in my presentation today a snapshot of a project I've been working on for several years for which you can read for yourself in issue 72.1 coming up uh, in several months. So uh, you'll be able to read this for yourself. So rather than read the uh, text itself, which is some 80 pages worth of notes right now, I'm going to condense it down into a more sort of free-flowing overview of a very interesting topic, and that is A.E. Van Vogt and his relevance to general semantics. And the title of my paper comes from this excellent tome for which Corey and Lance here in the room, uh, Corey Anton and Lance Strait are editors. It's titled Korzybski And, and uh, I'm going to begin in a moment um, with this text uh, as the start of my presentation. Um, so I highly encourage you to uh, look at this, and in particular the essay that I'm going to reference in a minute. But just as by way of a quick backdrop, um, born in 1953, uh, I was squarely in the middle of um, our um, love of the fictional narratives of science. Um, uh, rockets to the moon, possibly aliens on Mars. These were the things of my youthful fantasies that um, were part and parcel to that age in time. Um, Star Trek grew out of that. And so A.E. Van Vogt, the center of my paper, is the um, kind of the genesis or the focal point of all of those fictional narratives. Um, I'd like to think that it has to be of a cybernetic ecology and all watched over by machines of loving grace. I want to thank Tom for that wonderful opening quote from Richard Brodigan, one of my literary poetic heroes, and also Tom's reference in that same breath to Philip K. Dick, and that's where I'm going to begin my presentation from. And I also want to thank all three of my colleagues who preceded me. I wish we had time just to vamp on the wonderful things that were brought forward. In the essay in this text here, Korzybski and, um, written by Terry Bardini, um, he centers Korzybski in, in the middle of what we call cyber culture or cyberspace. And I'm going to read you the opening part of this because here he synthesizes or alludes to exactly the central thesis I'm going to make. Starting with a bold proposition, cyber culture is above all a reflection on the world of Philip K. Dick. This speed intoxicated pulp writer actually created this cyber world, or in his own words, remembered it first. He first saw through the iron cage of reality, got the glimpse of the first animesis. From the power invested in him by the logos, he actually created this world. He felt it in his bones and in his mind, and he recognized it like some long gone impression, like some, somebody who would wake up from a long cultural coma and this coma was named modernity. He is the mastermind behind it all, the paranoid writing android, the schizophrenic demiurge who first remembered it into being. Cyber culture is a figure of his animesis. But you might ask, what is the link with this strange count? The short answer, through Alfred Elton Van Vogt, one pioneer of the kind of pulp science fiction Philip K. Dick enjoyed so much. And this is a quote from Dick. There's no doubt who got me off originally, and it was A.E. Van Vogt. There was in Van Vogt's writing a mysterious quality, and this was especially true in the world of Null A. All the parts of that book didn't add up. All the ingredients didn't make a coherency. The thing that fascinated me so much was that this resembled reality more than anybody else's writing inside or outside science fiction. The central word to my thesis is sanity. And Korzybski's lifelong quest to ask, how do we go insane and how do we go sane? The book World of Null A, written in the 
serial form in the early 1940s, written by A.E. Van Vogt, has as the central theme the rule of the world through the Institute of General Semantics. And many of the chapters open with little epigraphs in the, in the front, many of them from Alfred Krzyzewski. This not only is considered perhaps the most influential work in the 20th century uh, development of science fiction, but many would argue now that science fiction itself is the most relevant narrative, fictional narrative of the 20th century, which places Van Vogt in the center of that and places Krzyzewski at the center of Van Vogt. So that's going to be the, the framework or the, the, the genesis from which this project will go from. Now, what you're going to find is some fascinating links. And unfortunately, we only have probably 10 more minutes left. How much time? Who's the timekeeper here? How are we doing, Marty? 11 minutes. 11 minutes. Beautiful. <laughs> this, for example, this was called The Wall of Sound from the 1974 Grateful Dead tour is part of our story that we'll get into at the end. But let me march you through um, what's really kind of the basic framework for this. I wish we could show a clip of Blade Runner here, um, which um, has the, what's con I, in fact, I actually gave a paper last week at another conference on film in, in the classroom, and I showed, and I talked about Blade Runner. Blade Runner, as Tom mentioned, is based upon a Philip K. Dick book called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And the title actually comes from, nowhere in the book is it mentioned Blade Runner. It actually comes from a book by William S. Burroughs and a mention in a book by William S. Burroughs. All of these people, uh, Burroughs, et cetera, were all followers of Korzybski. And that's the, the, the key that links all of these people. Um, for A.E. Van Vogt, who wrote the book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And for Ridley Scott, who produced the movie and directed it, the central theme was sanity. How do you know that you are real? And in this, it's considered the greatest death scene in, in movie history. It's where Rut, the Rutger Howard character, an android, is about to kill the Harrison Ford character, the cop. And at the last moment, he saves Harrison Ford because he realizes the android that he, it's time to die. And it's the most beautiful death scene in cinematic history. Uh, totally improvised at the end by, um, by Rutger Howard. And he talks about that um, as 30 years later, it's still for him, he relives that moment every day when he was actually asking that ontic question, what is it like to die? And again, the whole premise behind this is the question of sanity. In fact, there, there's a sequel in uh, pre-production right now uh, by Ridley Scott that uh, explores the question, is the Harrison Ford character really an android? So that's part two of this. And he is. Well, well, we'll see. Don't spoiler alert, for God's sakes, Lance. All right. Now, let me run through some things real quickly. John W. Campbell was at the heart of all of this. He was a pulp science fiction writer in the 30s who, where pulp science fiction was a new medium for the delivery of these narratives. It was literally disposable. It was used in World War II, pulp fiction, novel or the books were used as ballast on uh, cargo ships in World War II. It was disposable and so the idea was to crank this stuff out and he, John W. Campbell, lived in New Jersey and that's important, that's why I put this up here, he was in New Jersey and he was uh, cranking out these detective stories in the 30s and the, but he was really interested in um, different kinds of, 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 of ways of thinking about the world. He got into ESP early on, extrasensory perception early in the 30s, et cetera. And um, then he, got, he went to a couple of uh, Korzybski's seminars in 1938 and 39, and then was hooked on general semantics. Again, he lived in New Jersey, and he was the, became the editor of Astounding Science Fiction magazine, uh, sometimes called Astounding, and, some, and later on it was called Analog. They were all the same magazine, and he was the one responsible for the golden age of science fiction. And the four people who were the core of the golden age of science fiction were A.E. Van Vogt, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, and L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard and John W. Campbell lived on the East Coast. The other three, Heinlein, Asimov, and, and Van Vogt, lived in Hollywood. 
Um, and they all lived in a general area right underneath the Hollywood sign. Okay. So here's John W. Campbell, and you could see you know, already hid the influence of Korzybski on him just from the cigarette holder alone. Um, but again, he was um, a, uh, an early um, adopter of general semantic principles through his exposure to Korzybski in the, um, in the seminars. And some, one of the things he writes about uh, in some of his uh, bi uh, autobiographical writings is um, he was more he walked away not really understanding what Krzyzewski said, but he loved his Polish accent. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Heinlein is a critical part of this. He was the ringleader. He was the guy that kept this writing circle of science fiction writers together. There were a lot of parties at his house, etc. There's a l I did lots of research on this. There's lots of things out there on all of this stuff, including several articles and etc. Here's one from uh, 2007. Um, uh, called Heinlein and Ellis, where uh, um, Robert Heinlein is um, uh, compared to Albert Ellis in the work that was being done um, by him in, on the East Coast here. There's also some wonderful things in the Heinlein archives, um, a lot of richness there. Now, the, another one of the writers was Isaac Asimov, and this is a critical piece. When one asks the question, what's the role of science fiction in this narrative, this is a 1997 uh, part one of a two-part uh, set of articles on Asimov's laws of robotics, implication for information technology. What's important about this is this was written in the IEEE Journal, the Institute of Electrical Engineers. And they're the ones who are saying that it's because of the narrative of science fiction that we have the technology that we have. And, he, and the whole article is about um, the uh, 1940 law of robotics that was first developed by Isaac Asimov as a science fiction story in iRobot. And, they ta and that's what this IEEE article talks about, that without science fiction, without us as children growing up thinking about these things, we wouldn't have the, the, the world today. Here's a picture of Van Vogt himself. He was born in 1912 in Canada. And again, he moved uh, to Los Angeles in the early 1940s. Uh, what's important about that is, again, it was Heinlein, um, Van Vogt, and Asimov who were the, these, this literary circle of science fiction writers. And uh, because of um, uh, Campbell's relationship with all of these men, they influenced each other a lot in terms of the larger context in their life, which included L. Ron Hubbard, who was the fourth of, the, of this group, and L. Ron Hubbard um, is the one who developed the concept of Dianetics that eventually turned into Scientology. You can't ignore the question of the relevance of general semantics through the lens of science fiction unless you delve into largely the question of, of the role of Scientology in this. I mentioned that um, Campbell and Hubbard were living on the East Coast. It was Campbell who coerced A.E. Van Vogt to put aside general semantic thinking in his writing and take up Dianetics, for which he did. And, and Van Vogt became the West Coast president of, of, the, of the Dianetics Institute, which eventually turned into the West Coast uh, chapter of the Church of Scientology. A.E. Van Vogt got heavily into it, actually, by his wife, and at this point, Van Vogt, Heinlein, all these people have been going to Korzybski lectures. They're talking about this at conferences, etc. And then suddenly, A.E. Van Vogt is turned on to Dianetics by one of his friends, L. Ron Hubbard, and, and he kind of gets sucked in hook, line, and sinker to that. How are we doing, Marty? Uh, Five more minutes. Okay. I could, this is a rich. Now, what you, I'm going to point to this here. This is online, this is a cool thing. Uh, again, there's tons of stuff available, but here's a chart showing the, the comparisons between Scientology and general semantics, and there's a lot of work out there being done in this stuff. But here's the cool part. I wanna go back to the core premise. It's about sanity, ultimately. <laughs> Through the fictional narratives of these science fiction writers, but there's four questions that that I'm asking when I'm thinking about, um, and I probably don't have it with me here, but let me just put this 
the final piece of this into a final framework. All of the stuff that's out there currently has a question of what is the role of general semantics to either Hubbard or to A.E. Van Vogt, and what's the effect of science fiction on the development of 20th and 21st century culture. What I'm asking is what is the damage done by, or where I guess where I ended up is, there is significant damage done by the popularization of general semantics in the 50s and 60s when we look at general semantics in the year 2014. And for that, let me see if I can find this. Oh, I know where I can find this real quickly. I hope. Um, maybe not. There is a very disturbing quote um, that summarizes, here it is right here. This is from just two years ago. And it's about A.E. Uh, A. Van Vogt and Korzybski. Equally disturbing was Van Vogt's love of general semantics, the brainchild of the charlatan Alfred Korzybski. Van Vogt was drawn to, first drawn to it while still in Canada. And then he talks later about how he got into it. But then he goes on, um, fortunately for the masses, Korzybski and all of this non-Aristotelian uh, training regimen would prove that he was the quack that he was. He goes on and on and on, page after page, about the relationship of, of general semantics to Van Vogt, and the assumption is Van Vogt was a, was a terrible writer, a terrible influence, and he was influenced by this terrible scholar, Alfred Korzybski. And when you look at the, at the rhetoric online right now in the analysis of this question, the relationship between A.E. Van Vogt and general semantics, you, you find a lot more of this people associating Scientology, Hubbard, um, A.E. Van Vogt, and all of that into the current understanding of what general semantics is. It's a critical question if we ask, if that's the public perception that's coming out of this very important strain of influence on contemporary thought, we have to ask ourselves, what do we do next in terms of creating a context to understand this? And again, it, it starts with this comparison of these two things here, because when people think of general semantics, if you look again at the current rhetoric, they equate it with Scientology, and it's, it's a, that's a scary thought. So uh, again, there's a lot of richness here. Oh, let me real quickly, I'm gonna do this very fast. One minute. What's the connection with the Grateful Dead? Check this out. Macintosh ampli amplifiers, right? Uh, they're the ones who designed the wall of sound for the Grateful Dead. And in particular, this guy, Roger Russell, he was the acoustical expert. He designed speaker systems for Macintosh. He, when he joined this, when he joined Macintosh Computers, again, an East Coast company, Gordon Gow, the vice president, was the first to, uh, to welcome him. Gordon Gow at the time was a member of the board of trustees of the Institute of General Semantics. And the head of sales for, uh, for Macintosh was the one who got GS principles into Macintosh amplifiers early on in its history. So when you look at, he has this wonderful history of Macintosh amplifiers, but I found out about this through Roger Russell's other website, which is on A.E. Van Vogt. And you go through this, and there's a ton of stuff about general semantics, how it got in, integrated into Macintosh <coughs> labs, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of information out there uh, on all this stuff, all of it fascinating, all of it saying there was something going on with Korzybski and general semantics. I'm just confused at what it is. And so that's, again, the, the, I think the conundrum we're facing. How do we make sense out of this nonsense that's out there confusing general semantics, what they perceive it to be, rather than what it is? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.